that would be a presumption that I would not, of which I would not wish to be guilty. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you. What message is it appropriate to bring to a 53rd anniversary celebration? In considering this, it's a message to veterans. Some of you have been around that whole 53 years, some of you less, but we're all veterans. I mean, once you've been through a battle in, a, in the military, you are a veteran. And we've all had our battles, we've all had our learning experiences. And so I wish to concentrate today on a message to veterans that was delivered to the church on or about, and you've got to allow for some... Um, you know, inaccuracy here, but somewhere around the 65th anniversary of the first century church, there was a message to veterans written by an apostle of Jesus Christ. It was basically, not, not quite taking dictation, but pretty close. And that was the apostle John who wrote the book that we know today as Revelation. And in Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon come to pass. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. This is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then he says, right at the start of this message, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and obey what is written in it for the time is near the clear intention of Jesus Christ is that the people who read this prophecy preferably aloud that's what it means the people who read this prophecy should become worshipful participants. Now, the word worshipful will come up as we go through as to why he's saying that. But we are supposed to be worshipful participants. We are not expected by God to be doing the stuff of fascinated spectators. We are actually to be worshipful participants. And there are spectator specifics. Uh, specifics. Uh, in which we have all indulged at various times, or some of these, or all of these. For example, the desirability of 144,000. Looking beyond mammon. Enduring to the end. Supporting the work of prophecy. Coming out of her, my people. Redeeming the time. Preparing yourself for the master's return. Don't worship the beast. Don't mess with the text. All of these things are in there. All of these things are in there and therefore they are of God and they are desirable. We were supposed to come to the, all of these things as worshipful participants rather than fascinated spectators. And I will flesh out what I'm saying here as we go along. Probably one of the most helpful uh, aids to Revelation for me personally was when the love of my life expressed that in her reading of it, she viewed Revelation as almost like a second transfiguration. And suddenly a lot of cards fell into slots and, and a lot of things made sense. Because in the first transfiguration, when those three guys went up in the mountain with Jesus and they saw him in his glorified state, in a vision, they saw him in a glorified state, and he was conversing with Moses and Elijah and so forth. And then at the end of it, Peter got excited. He wanted to do stuff about what he'd just seen. And a, and a, um, a, a moderating voice from heaven called to him and said, This is my beloved son. Hear him. So one of those fellows that was on the mountain has a second shot on the island of Patmos. Years later, I mean, 60 years later, thereabouts. And it's like a second transfiguration. Jesus is seen in his glory, but not just Jesus himself, but the whole background. It's like Jesus went from showing them his glorified body. He now takes John back to his place. 
This is what's going on under the hood, people. This is where it's all happening. This is what drives the plan of my father. And with something like that driving God's plan, the things that are in the book of Revelation must surely come to pass because nothing's going to stop it. And it was a second transfiguration experience for John in which he was supposed to be, and he was successfully, gobsmacked. And a number of times he just fell down as, you know, as if dead and, and bowed down to worship the angel. And the angel told him, no, nope, get up. That's not part of the plan. Uh, but it's amazing that John was able to recognise that he should be a worshipful participant, not just a fascinated spectator. Now, it is understandable that we would be fascinated and that we would be spectators. But if that's the case, and if that's as far as it goes, we are not yet thinking as we should, because there's more to it than that. And that has to do, and takes its origin from, the state of the world. The state of the world in John's time, and the state of the world in our time. And so I'm going to go back to the mid-70s to an address delivered by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the, um, the Russian patriot and uh, author and analyst who delivered a, a uh, commencement address, that is a graduation address at Harvard University. And he said this after they uh, conferred upon him an honorary doctorate of letters. He said in his address to the nation through Harvard University, he said, the Western system in its present state of spiritual exhaustion does not look attractive. Hastiness and superficiality are the psychic disease of the 20th century. That hasn't stopped. You know, it didn't stop at the millennium. It's still a problem. More than anywhere else, this disease is reflected in the press. In-depth analysis of a problem is anathema to the press. There is a dangerous tendency to form a herd, shutting off successful develop development of independent thought. And boy, you can see that everywhere. How did the West decline from its triumphal march to its present sickness? The mistake must be at the root, at the very basis of human thinking in the past centuries. An erroneous worldview became the basis for government and social science and could be defined as rationalistic humanism or humanistic autonomy. That's thanks to the Enlightenment, which I believe, apparently with Solzhenitsyn, is the most misnamed part of, our, of, of human history. It wasn't Enlightenment, it was diving into darkness. The proclaimed and enforced autonomy of man from any higher force above him. It based modern Western civilization on the dangerous need to worship man and his material needs. However, in, it is no less so now, is it? <laughs> More so now. However, in early democracies, as in American democracy at the time of its birth, remember he's saying this in America, all individual human rights were granted because man is God's creature. That is, freedom was given to the individual conditionally in the assumption of his constant religious responsibility. Subsequently, however, all such limitations were discarded everywhere in the West. A total liberation occurred from the moral heritage of Christian centuries with their great reserves of mercy and sacrifice. The West ended up by truly enforcing human rights, sometimes even excessively, but man's sense of responsibility to God and society grew dimmer and dimmer. That is no less true today than it was when he spoke those words and it was true before he spoke those words, but Solzhenitsyn just encapsulates that perfectly. Well, that is a universal problem. And it is a problem which heavily affects the Christian church. And that was seen by another young pastor years ago who put it into writing. 
His name was Eugene H. Peterson, recently deceased. But he found a tool. He found a very helpful, let's say, remedy for the problems facing the society that he was trying to pastor in. He found an ally, as he says here in a, an article I have here, that this will be up on the website eventually. This is when I found an ally in John's revelation. For revelation is a representation of the good news of Jesus Christ to congregations afflicted with these precise cultural conditions. Now, it wasn't brought about by the Enlightenment in the first century. It was actually brought about by a group of uh, philosophers called the Gnostics, which infiltrated the church and began to pollute the gospel. But the same conditions, different causes. The first century church were experiencing a trivialization of the gospel and a deflection of the gospel due to persecution. But John silenced all of this and put it in its place. And he did it in the simplest and mo most economical of ways. He called the people to worship. And that's how Eugene Peterson sees the book of Revelation. The trivialization in John's world was taking place through the gossip of those whose aberrant teachings would soon become known as Gnosticism. The essential nature of gossip is that it talks about people instead of to them. Gossip leaves out all that is unique and glorious in a person and reduces him or her to an anecdote or a cliche or a stereotype. Gossip is never in awe. Gossip is never in love. And these people were running about talking lots and lots and lots about God, but they weren't talking to him. They didn't believe in prayer. And they weren't, there wasn't any two-way communication. The Gnostics gossiped about God. They claimed to know a lot about God. Gnostic means one who knows. But it was all about God. Gnostics did not pray. They did not worship. Gnostics talked a lot to each other and wrote endlessly about what they thought. And God was reduced to an anecdote or fantasised into a speculation. And in the New Testament, there is direct and indirect evidence of the presence of these Gnostics and the danger that they boded for the gospel. Paul was up against them for the whole period of his ministry. As a pastor, John knew he had to keep his people or help his people disentangle themselves from such gossip or the gospel would be trivialised beyond recognition. And it very nearly was. Very nearly was. In the guise of leading people into deep understanding of God, the Gnostics were in fact accommodating God to the terms of their culture. Because that doesn't happen today, does it? I mean, different churches wheel out those aspects of Jesus Christ that they think might suit or else provide free balloons for the kiddies at the door or seek a sensitive... <clears throat> anyway. God is not to be accommodated to the terms of our culture. But that's what they were doing, thereby reducing him to their ideas and fads. The parallel with our culture is striking. So many aspects of the church's life are being reduced to items of gossip and consumer pricing. Christians have succeeded in marketing crosses to the various tastes of consumers. We have replaced saints with celebrities, and it is increasingly difficult to take any of it seriously. Oh, that's true, man, that is true. The parallel conditions in John's time and ours is trivialisation and tribulation. His astonishingly focused and simple response, calling people to worship, commends Revelation as a text for recovering the integrity of the gospel in a bad time. Now, you know, pretty much all of us are veterans of some degree here, and we know that the integrity of the gospel is in danger from the society around us. And we ourselves are in danger of losing the integrity of the gospel in our own thinking. Essentially, that is what revelation is. An act of worship that calls others into the act of worship.
On the first page, we see John at worship. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. On the last page, we see John momentarily distracted by an angel, commanded back to the centre. Worship God, he's told in Revelation 22.9. If there's any doubt about what Revelation is about, it's sandwiched between, you need to worship God. Between that first and last page, we have scene after scene of robust worship. The sights and the sounds pulling together everything in heaven and earth, in creation and cross, in history and salvation, all involving us in worship. But we are so easily distracted, and I mean we, capital W, capital E, because I am sadly one of the most easily distractible people I know. And I quite often apologise in Jesus' name at the end of my pathetic prayer because of that, because I am so easily distracted. Distracted as easily by trivialisation as by tribulation. John's vision, if only we submit ourselves to it, is powerful enough to catch our attention and pull us back to the main action, to the God centre. It is imaginative enough to enlist our bodies, minds and emotions in participation in worship. Big stuff. Big stuff. By the time we have come to this final entry in the library of 66 books, our minds are bursting with knowledge and our hearts are bursting with desire. But it's all about the earth, up till Revelation. It's all about what went on and what's going on on earth. Revelation, the whole scene changes. With all that knowledge and all that desire, there's a great danger that we will just run off and put it to good use. Tell everybody we know. Enlist everyone in our cause. Communicate. Motivate. The Christian world is full of it. Communicate. Motivate. That, and that is just what we, the churches and church leaders of America, which is how he wrote it, we've been silly enough to follow suit, which makes us one step below. We, the churches and church leaders of America, have done this, to run off to communicate and motivate. And between them, communication and motivation dominate the current Christian agenda. I mean, think about it. Every ad you see, every, every email you get from a church or whatever, it's all the same. Communicate and motivate. The communication conveys much accurate information and the motivation enlists us in many good causes. So, why aren't things any better? Why isn't the truth well known? Why isn't righteousness flourishing? Why is the American church such an embarrassment? Why are we stupid enough to take it on, seeing that it's an embarrassment? Why are its pastors so demoralised? Maybe it is because we didn't stay around for the reading of this last book. Didn't let ourselves be called to worship. We failed to be immersed in the act of worship so thoroughly that it would be unthinkable to run off and do anything on our own, no matter how biblical, no matter how urgent. But the truth of the gospel, if you want this in one sentence, the truth of the gospel is God in Christ rules and saves. That's the gospel. God in Christ rules and saves. All else is commentary. The reality of the human condition is that, however, since the Enlightenment, we are determined to rule and save. and that we might make a thorough mess of it every time we do. We want to rule ourselves and save ourselves. We want to rule others and save others. Doesn't work. Hasn't worked. We thought it was for a few centuries, but it's not. Even at our best, we can't do it. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound a little bit like what we've understood about, come to understand about grace and incarnational Trinitarian theology? Even at our best, we can't do it, no matter how much we know, no matter how well-intentioned we are, even when we have mastered Genesis through Jude, we still can't do it. We can't because only God in Christ can rule and save. We have, it is quite true, a part in the ruling and the saving, but it's strictly an obeying and believing part. 
And the only way in which we can stay alert to the reality of God in Christ ruling and saving is in the act of worship. The only way we can be trusted to say anything about God that is close to true, to do anything for God that is halfway right, is by the repeated and faithful practice of singing and praying, listening and believing with the elders and the animals around the throne where the scroll is unsealed and the gospel is read out clear and strong. If we absent ourselves from worship, now we don't do that, but he also says, if we treat worship as marginal to our agenda of communication and motivation, we become dominated by the visible. But most of the reality with which we have to deal is invisible. Worship is the primary and most accessible means we are given for orienting ourselves in the invisibilities in God. And Revelation is, along with the Psalms, the most comprehensive rendering of worship that we have. It is precisely a vision, a seeing of the invisible, a Christian community that is not rooted in and shaped by the invisible, the throne and the lamb, very soon falls under control of communicators and motivators. And that is epidemic among us today. Religion as communication, religion as motivation. Too many worship services in churches are mere fronts for the pastor's ego or the congregation's needs or both. That is what John saw going on in his churches. And he responded by energetically and magnificently setting them in the place of worship before the living God under the command of the risen Christ, renewed by the Holy Spirit. And I might add that Jesus Christ put that solution there for him. This wasn't something he dreamed up, it was something Jesus put there. Everything they were concerned with, along with everyone they knew or could imagine, was shown by the preached vision to be comprehended in the act of worship. And they still are. John's revelation can help us. For once we are immersed in this exuberance of sound and colour, we will certainly lose our taste for gossip. And once we comprehend the comprehensiveness of grace and the empty pretensions of evil, we're not likely to cave in to the bullying of the principalities and the powers. Once we have taken our place in a pew with John, leading us into an act of worship, we will never again say just worship or willingly absent ourselves from the action or I would like to add nor will we take it lightly too lightly everybody wants a saviour but very few want Jesus to be Lord Jesus as saviour is the unconditional love of God Jesus as Lord is the unconditional obedience of his children. And we should never forget that. Hence, our true worship leader is Jesus Christ. If you're going to be here in this pulpit, understand that. It's not about you. This is about him. Revelation of Jesus Christ by himself, about himself and his revelation of the reality of his plan. And the, 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 the model prayer that we have been told by the Master himself to pray is thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth. And revelation is as it is in heaven. That's, that's what's going on in heaven and that needs to be down here. It doesn't start here, it starts there. And it's transmitted to us. And so our participation in Revelation is not to try and chart it, though we have tried. We're not, it, 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 our, our worship of God is not expressed in getting the, the seals and the plagues and the vials all sorted out in chronological order and figuring out 
whose name adds up to 666 and all that stuff. It's, it's fascinating. It is fascinating. Can't deny it. It's fascinating. But that's not our participation. That's not what God is after. He also doesn't want us to speculate on fulfilment dates. How do we know that? Jesus said so. I mean, surely that's enough. <laughs> but rather, our obedience to the book of Revelation is to join the worshippers in heaven. Because that's what Revelation is about. It's a book of words. It's got a lot of detail in it. It's got a lot of detail. But the point of the book is that we join with the worshippers and prostrate ourselves before our God in heaven. And so today, time limits, I want to give you just four. Just four. There are dozens. But I want to give you just four of the many implications for ongoing worshipful participation in the book of Revelation beyond fascinated spectating. And the first of these, you don't have to turn to them, but I'll, I'll give you the references. The first of these is the, is the second and third chapters of Revelation, right? We know them as, as the seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And at the end of each of those messages, there is an admonition. Let him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to all the churches. Every one of us who has any kind of spiritual con connection needs to understand our first and primary love must be maintained. We must be able and willing and prepared to endure persecution. We must resist societal corruption. You know, as you know, I'm going through those letters here. We must beware of rationalising sin. We must pay attention to strengthening what remains. We must be committed to patient endurance. And the last one, so, so typical of this era in our society, we must resist the effects of materialism. Because we are rich and increased with goods. But I don't want to spend any time on any one of them. But Hear what the Spirit says to all the churches. Now, if you're parked over here in eras, you're only going to read Philadelphia, because chances are that's where you'd be parked. No, hear what the Spirit says to all the churches. Because that's what the Master said. That's what he said to John. John wrote it down. But the Master himself said, hear it all. There's value in it. The next reference... Revelation 10 and verse 7. John is fascinated with the message of the seven thunders. Wow, man, he is so wrapped in it. I've got to get this down. And he goes, he, he, he dips his quill in the... <laughs> and the angel says, ah, 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 sorry, John. No, 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 no. Seal it up. Don't write it down. Why tell us about it? You know, has that not caused you some anxiety or something? You know, I mean, oh, come on, John. Well, how do we obey the book of Revelation in this case? We need to accept that we can't know it all. Accept that we don't know it all. Accept that we're not going to know it all. We'll know lots of it, bits of it. But we are naturally curious. And, and isn't that part of being made in the image of God? Well, I'm not so sure. I'm not sure what God's curious about. I mean, what have you got to be curious about? But in any case, he's made us curious. That we know. It's part of our, how we've been fashioned. It's naturally curious. And if we can't know what we are told is there but hasn't been revealed, we obsess about it. But see, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. We are in a constant quest never to have to say wow because we want to quantify it all. We want to know it all. And when we know it all, we haven't got to say wow because we understand it. And one of, the, one of the quirks of human nature is that we tend 
to try and command what we think we've conquered. And if we think we've conquered Revelation, we're going to use it. It's not going to use us, we're going to use it. And in, in the case of people who think they have conquered it, that's what they've done. They've used it as a club over people's heads. Also a part of this Revelation 10.17 is the reference that I alluded to earlier, Mark 13.32, about that day, he's talking about the time of his return, about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the sun. Nah, not good enough. If you work out the number of 19-year time cycles between the fall of uh, Babylon, you know, and the, you know, and all this 2,520 years, take away the number you first third off, you know, that, that, that works. Nah, we've got to have it all sorted. Hey, and this is not a, you know, this is we, because I've, I've been as excited about that stuff. Futile. Futile and disobedient, actually. If Jesus has said, you're not going to know, wh what am I doing trying to figure it out? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> See, that's the, you know, you, you look back at Matthew 24 and he says, well, you know, watch. Watch. But what do you watch? What do you watch? The answer is in Revelation. You watch Jesus Christ. You, you're going to keep an eye on world events. You're going to know all this stuff is in a general way, but you are not going to know the day or the hour. You're not going to know it. Well, in Revelation 7, we find the innumerable multitude washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. That what did Bruno call it? The, the universal detergent, yeah, cosmic detergent or whatever. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, not in their own righteousness, but in the blood of the Lamb. The admonition I would have here in terms of, um, this is what I derive from obeying the book of Revelation, accept his righteousness, which means dispense with my own. Because if I want to hang on to mine, you know, if I'm really that married to the filthy rags that is my righteousness, no, it accomplishes nothing except his righteousness. And not only that, you know, that it's better than mine, but accept it. Recognise, Bruno says, you know, he came to church and he'd been washed. And he felt washed. He knew he was washed. He didn't have to come in there, oh, I'm a, you know, a sinner. No, he was washed. Accept what he says, but certainly dispense with your own. And the final implication of this today, as I say, there are dozens, and that's what our study of Revelation ought to be. How do I obey the words of this prophecy as a, a worshipful participant rather than as a fascinated spectator? I'm not trying to get... Revelation sorted out and all put into the periodic table so I know where I can grab it and use it when I want to. Revelation uses me. I don't use Revelation. And that has something to do with this last one. Revelation 4.24, you've got 24 elders or 24 beings of some sort and they are before the throne of God and they have crowns. Now, we know what crowns are. Crowns represent sovereignty. And what they do is they see the Ancient of Days, and they take off their crowns and they cast them at his feet. They surrender sovereignty to him. And then they do it again. And then they do it again. And then they do it again. Is this because they are programmed automata? Does God actually have programmed automata in his presence? Does that sound like the God you worship? No, they, they pick him up. And then they cast them down again because they are generally bowled over by who they are before, by God, by the greatness of God, by the mercy of God, by the power of God. They yield sovereignty. 
Now, how on earth do I obey that? I don't think that's complicated at all. I have to yield my personal sovereignty to God 20 times a week. Not my will, but yours be done. I surrender my sovereignty. Jesus Christ is Lord. I am not my own Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. I surrender my sovereignty to you, God. And I do that as often as these guys are doing it. And that's just when I remember to do it. Chances are these ones don't forget. But, you know, we're in a situation, how many times, how many times in your life have you been in a situation where it's got to be not my will but yours be done? That's happening as often down here on earth as it is in heaven. Get the, take the cues. Take the cues from Revelation and use them in life. Because that's the prayer. As in heaven, so on earth. Your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. That's what's going on in heaven. That's what's going to have to happen in my life if I'm going to be fulfilling that. So yeah, the book of Revelation is a book of prophecy. Prophecy being inspired preaching, but also foretells the future. It, it tells of events which must surely come to pass. When they come to pass, how they come to pass, how it's charted, the chronology, the name of the beast, whether they're, you know, whether it's Europe or whether it's somebody else, that's not part of it. I mean, it, it, it will eventually. You know, the, you know what, what happens will happen. But it's an inspired prophecy about being reframed. We need to reframe our view. And for me, that's going to take a long time because I've been... 50 plus years thinking about it another way. But Revelation, with the help of what we've learned and with the help of my mentor, Peterson, Revelation is indeed being reframed to, wow, look where he lives. Look what he's doing. I mean... What, what, look at the firepower. <laughs> look, look at the, I mean, look at the capability. Look at the mercy. Look at the love. Praise be to the Lamb. I mean, you can see why the whole place just erupts. Because you were slain. And you've brought this together. If, you, if the thing, the point, if you want to get a... A, a physical point out of Revelation he's got it under control <laughs> which is the ultimate understatement but God has it under control one of the and I'm sure you'll remember this one of the what is now embarrassing you know they, they, they raise embarrassing stories when you turn 21 or you know whatever one of the embarrassing stories of our history is when some bright spark said, oh, I've read the end of the story and we win. Everybody's heard that, right? It kind of sums up the fascinated spectator as distinct from the worshipful participant because if you think by reading the end of the story that we win, you haven't read it. Where in Revelation does it say we win? Now, worshipful participants read the end of the story and they know darn well we didn't win. We're not going to win. They celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ has already. we got nothing to do with it other than jump on the wagon <laughs> and enjoy the ride. Worshipful participants celebrate the glorious fact that Jesus Christ already won. And the 1 Corinthians 15 resurrection chapter where all things are subject to him. All things, except the Father. But all things are subject to him. And that's, that's a whole lot more worshipful than we win. There's not an ounce of worship in we win. There's all worship in he has. 
And so I would ask us to consider Revelation as an instance where Jesus Christ is lifting the hood and showing us the engine that drives God's plan. And when you've seen the engine, then everything that's in the book must surely come to pass because there's nought is going to stop it. And so to conclude, I would like to go back 30 years odd before Revelation, actually 25 years odd before Revelation was written, to another message to veteran Hebrews. And again, you don't have to turn there, but Hebrews chapter 12, the whole of chapter 12, I'm not going to read the whole of the chapter, but he says, Therefore, the writer of Hebrews, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, he's talking about the hall of fame, of faith. But I'm saying, I'm, I'm applying it to Revelation, right? You've got all this stuff in Revelation. Given that, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race set out before us. And like the participants in Revelation, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amongst billions of bellowing angels, roaring in accolade, Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Because, fellow veterans, you've not come to a mountain that can be touched. It's not about the physical. Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, which, I might add, is coming back here. You have come to myriads of angels in joyful assembly, to the congregation of the firstborn enrolled in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Therefore, since we are receiving an unshakable kingdom, if you want to know how unshakable it is, read the Revelation. It's unshakable. Nothing can touch it. And since we are receiving that kingdom, let us be filled with gratitude and so worship God, worship God acceptably, not half-heartedly, not in a slovenly manner, but worship him acceptably with reverence and awe. He's our father, but he is also a consuming fire. Let's remember the awe that we should have. And as I've mentioned before, you know, that great big skipping rope, kids, it's about 40 feet long and the kids are turning that rope and that's what this life is about. We're getting into the rhythm and sometimes we make movements as if we're in it, but we're not quite in there yet. But we're getting into the rhythm so that we can join Jesus Christ himself, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, the myriad of angels worshipping and revelling in the presence of their father, his father, our father, who art in heaven. <laughs>